Venga. Again, we're going to look together into the Word of God to discover truth. The Bible is the truth. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the Lord also said that he is the Word of God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So as we are reading the Bible, we are reading truth, ultimate, absolute truth. Now, again, as I've said so very frequently, there are many things in the Bible that we don't like. We don't like them at all. But the we have to remember the Bible is God's word to the human race, and we better listen carefully, listen carefully to what God has to say. Now, presently, we are working in the, we've begun to work in the book of Jeremiah. That's a book in the Old Testament, a prophecy of the Old Testament, that very few pastors look at uh, for two big reasons. One is it's a, such a negative book. Secondly, it is very difficult to understand. Only because we're right near the end of time, uh, these end time prophecies are are being revealed to us, can we now read the book of Jeremiah and begin to get an understanding that would have been impossible even a few years ago. Now, we've started in the book of Jeremiah, and we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 1, and uh, we're going to go on in our study in Jeremiah chapter 1. And a key verse that we have already looked at is verse 10, where God is saying to Jeremiah after he had uh, put his God's hand on his mouth so that the words that he would be speaking would be God's word. God said, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and plant. These infinitives are very, very abrupt and very uh, uh, direct. Uh, they cannot be missed, but the, their God is establishing a principle in this verse. Maybe we talked about it, but it bears repeating. It's such an important principle, namely that Jeremiah is really speaking for the Word of God. The moment that God put his hand on Jeremiah's mouth, it's as if what he has to say now is the Word of God. As a matter of fact, it is the Word of God. What Jeremiah is saying is in the Bible as the Word of God. But this Word of God rules over all of the nations. That's a principle God is establishing in this verse. This Word of God rules all of the kingdoms of the world. If we have actually become saved during our lifetime, uh, we've already met the, pro the conditions called for and the, the provisions called for in the Word of God. We've, we've already made payment for our sin, and we can be with Christ. But if we haven't made payment for our sin, and maybe we've never heard about the Bible at all, Yet the Bible rules. You broke this law, you broke that law, you broke the other law of the Word of God. You, because the Bible rules over every human. Uh, of course, the real blessing comes is it comes when we recognize before we are dead, before Christ has returned again, that this is true, and and by God's mercy we have become saved, so that so that we can answer to God uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ that our guilt has been removed. But uh, the, 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 the principle that God is establishing here is that God rules over all the nations. Now, he's going to particularize, particularly as we go along, with the nation of Judah, and the city of Jerusalem. And we're going to see that very quickly as we continue this study. But they, again, are just part of the nations of the world. And they are part of the peoples of the world. They come under the heading that God rules over all the nations of the world. There is no group of people, 
no group of people anywhere in any time of history that can say, well, we are not under the authority of the Bible. That does not exist. Now, the, the uh, second principle that we're, we've just begun to look at is in verse 15. Verse 15. Now, God is going to begin to particularize. He's established the principle that he rules over all the nations of the world. And now he's, de- he's going to declare a, his, uh, his particular message against a nation, a people. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. All right, now, God is saying two things here. First of all, he's saying, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the world, of the north. And if, as we tie that into other references in the Bible, like uh, uh, the nations from the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, will come against the camp of the saints, we know that this is a very big statement, that God is is bringing all the kingdoms of the world, that is all the... Uh, the uh, the uh, resources of Satan to bring judgment upon Jerusalem and Judah. And we'll, we'll uh, uh, discover here in the book of Jeremiah very early who Jerusalem and Judah, which Jerusalem and Judah God really has in view. And we're not going to like it a bit, but we'll come to that in pre- presently. But here he is saying he's going to bring all of these nations... And they shall come and shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the wells thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. Now, if the nations of the world who don't know God, and yet they're under the command of God, because God is God, they have set their throne at the entrance of the gates into Jerusalem and against and and the entrance into the cities of Judah what does that tell you what does that tell you it means that nobody can come in or out of Jerusalem because there is an enemy that has set his throne at the gates in other words Judah is blocked Judah is blocked Jerusalem is blocked. God has something ominous developing here, terribly ominous developing, and He is uh, He He has uh, has brought these nations to surround Jerusalem immediately. Of course, we think of a verse like uh, Luke chapter twenty-one when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. This is speaking of the very same thing, that the armies of the world have been brought around Jerusalem. Now, as we go on, we will know that that there was a historical antecedent here, uh, 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 namely that there was a time when God brought Babylon, a nation from the north, and, and it set its armies against the the city of Jerusalem and against the cities of Judea. And, uh, and uh, finally, in the year 587, they were destroyed, altogether destroyed. But now comes a very, very interesting question and a very important question. Is this the main message of the book of Jeremiah? We're still in its, the beginning stages of understanding the book of Jeremiah. Is the main task of the book of Jeremiah to inform us that that ancient Judah and Jerusalem had become so wicked that God has brought the enemy against them? And, and the next verse indicates that they're there not for any uh, 
any beautiful purpose for Jerusalem, but as a judgment. I will utter my judgment, uh, uh, judgments against them, uh, that is, Jerusalem and the cities of Judea, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and worship the works of their own hands. Now, before we try to understand that, we better see if we can discover who really does God have in view. And so we're going to jump down. We're going to uh, leave verse 15 for a moment, and we're going to go down to chapter 2. Chapter 2, because there God gives us definition, and it's definition that we're not going to like at all, but it will help us to understand the nature of the book of Jeremiah and really why God has placed it in the Bible. Was it placed in the Bible in the first instance as a, as a tirade against ancient Jerusalem and Judah? Uh, in fact, as a matter, it wasn't even written in the Bible at that time because the, the, uh, the account itself is discussing what happened at that time, but uh, why finally did it find its place? The book of Jeremiah, why did it find its place in the Bible? And we're going to discover this as, as if we look for a moment at Genesis or Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2. Now, we can read this very fast, and, and it doesn't register anything, but when we read it carefully and ponder it in the light of the whole Bible, then we discover this is a very, very important verse. Jeremiah 2, verse 2. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals. Now, espousals has to do with the with the uh, betrothal of uh, of uh, God to Israel, the fact that God has uh, uh, it's it's like the beautiful statements that are being made by the bride to be to the husband to be, and the uh, the uh, romantic uh, uh, love that exists between them, the love of thine espousals. When thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. All right, now we begin to examine this verse. And we know that Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness after they came out of Egypt. And before that, uh, in fact, if you search the Bible, you don't find that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelt in the wilderness. God just doesn't use that language. They dwelt in the promised land. Uh, Israel had really not become a real nation until after they left Egypt. And then we read that they were in the wilderness, in the wilderness, in the wilderness, in the wilderness. We read that over and over and over again during that 40-year period. So this is when we would expect to see the, what God is talking about. I remember thee the kindness of thy youth, the love of thy espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness. So we search the Bible for any anything that God has to say about the love of Israel for God while they were in the wilderness. Uh, when they, it's not talking about when they were in Egypt. That was Egypt. It's not talking about when they came into the land of Canaan. That was the land of Canaan. It's not talking about when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were in the land of Canaan. That is the promised land. But the wilderness is the wilderness. That was the 40 years that, that, that they lived in, in, uh, uh, on their way from Egypt into the land of Canaan. Now, when we search the Old Testament or church, search the whole Bible, there are only two statements, at least that I've been able to find, that have the slightest salutary or happy relationship expressed between Israel and God. We have plenty of statements of 
murmuring and and of rebellion and uh, and uh, going their own way and plagues coming upon them. We have lots of that. But when we search, we finally come to Exodus chapter 19, verse 8. Exodus chapter 19, verse 8. And we have to search for this because God is talking about, I remember the kindness of your youth when you were in the wilderness. So we wonder, well, where... Where, where was this that Israel was so kind toward God? And, uh, and uh, there we read where Moses is, is uh, speaking to them the, third, uh, the uh, third month after they'd come out of Egypt and, uh, and is making certain promises unto them. He says in verse 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered in t- together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Now we find that statement, but we don't find any action on their part that that uh, backs up this statement. It, it isn't long at all, and they were rebelling. In fact, right after this, they had the experience of the law being given on Mount Sinai, and they they uh, were already saying, "Look, we uh, we we don't want to hear from God." We are. They were already showing their inherent rebellion. And as a matter of fact, we as we look at these verses, we have to keep in mind. Hold your finger there for a moment and go back to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And and in Hebrews chapter 3, God is talking about Israel that was in the wilderness. And so if there's going to be some indication of a time when they had kindness and love toward God, we ought to find it somewhere. But what do we read in verse 17 of Hebrews 3? But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They perished in the wilderness. And who perished in the wilderness? Everyone that was older than 20, 20 years or older that came out of Egypt, only Joshua and Caleb went into the land of Canaan. They perished because of unbelief. So that doesn't talk about kindness. And so when they are saying in Exodus 19, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, that's an assertion on their part that they are going to do, a, do it in a way that is pleasing to God, but it's, they're not waiting upon God to save them. That's like those who are saying, Oh, I see, we have to believe in Christ in order to be saved. Well, then I'll believe in Christ. And that isn't a broken and a contrite heart at all. This is someone who is saying in the pride of their life, uh, we will do it, we'll make it, we'll make it. And then the proof of the pudding is in that we see them in rebellion. They are not about to, to do it because no one can do it. They should have answered here, Uh, All that the Lord has spoken, we would like to do. Oh, may the Lord give us his mercy that we might do it. Then we'd have something that would be kindness toward God. Now, there's one other passage, just one other, that I've been able to find. And that is also found in Exodus. And it's in, uh, in Exodus chapter 35, verse 5. Exodus chapter 35, verse 5. And that's at the time that they were uh, called upon to provide the gold and silver and the labor and so on to build the tabernacle. And, uh, and uh, we, we read in, in verse 4, And Moses spake, this is a... Exodus 35, verse 4, And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded thee, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold, silver, and brass, and 
blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goats and so on. And uh, then we read in verse 20, And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for his service, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold. And every man that offered offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And uh, and uh, so this is, uh, we read in verse 29, the children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. Now again, on the surface, this looks like it was a time when they really loved the Lord, and they were really uh, the, God's people. And maybe this is what God is talking about. I know your kindness when you were young. But the fact is, when we examine this, this has to do with good works. It had, doesn't have to do with salvation. They are doing something in order to get right with God. They're doing it with a willing heart. But the consequence of all this does not mean that their hearts were broken before God. It is not the love of a child of God. It is, not, it is uh, simply an action. But when we go back to Jeremiah again, when we go back to Jeremiah, there we have the language of, of love. Uh, of, and, and the language of love has to do with, with a relationship with God. Because unless we are saved, we have no love for God. We, these Israelites did not have a love for God. They had a love for themselves because they perished in the wilderness because of, of unbelief. They did not have a love for God. And, but it doesn't have any relationship to whether they truly have become saved or not. But now, yet, let's read Jeremiah 2, verse 2. Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Now, the land that was not sown, that is the wilderness. But it is also talking about a time right at the very beginning of something, very beginning of something. If we, on the other hand, now go to another Jerusalem, another Jerusalem, namely the New Testament church. And can, let's, let's start right out with the question, can we identify that with any uh, biblical authority as identified with Jerusalem? We'll, we'll uh, take a look at that in our next study.